Christ. We're so glad to see you in the house of God. Let's put our hands together. With gratitude, we worship. Not just because we got energy. It's raining, I know. But because of what Jesus did. Come on. And wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide. This weary soul.
Now, what better way to thank our Savior than through baptism? We're doing baptisms today. What God's done yesterday, what he did for you, he's doing for others. Come on, so let's celebrate this today. Come on.
thank you, God, for your mercy and your grace that has made this baptism Sunday take place. People brought from death to life, from hell to heaven. We thank you for that today, God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name, God. Thank you, Lord. We know you will do it again.
We ask that our, this day would be defined by your presence, that we could look back at this and say, here was a monument of worship that we built unto the Lord. And Lord, there's no, there's no labor that we could do. There's nothing that we could give that could even begin to thank you for what you have done for us, Lord. It is all your grace. It is all the gift that you have given. But Lord, we will give you everything that we have. And I pray that you would open our hearts to the word today to the, the message coming through the worship, the message coming through your holy scripture, Jesus. And we're saying we don't want anything else to have dominion over our lives. We want nothing else to have leadership over our church, but the Holy Spirit, but Jesus Christ, the Father, the Holy Trinity reigning over everything that we do, over every heart, over every mind. And Lord, I ask for just a special anointing to be over those that got baptized today, Lord. Jesus, would you just, would that soil just be turned up right now, would be turned up so that the seed of your word would go in so deep to that right level at the right time so that it could grow up and bring a harvest for your kingdom, Lord. And may that be true for all of us, Lord Jesus. We just want to grow a field just sown well for your glory, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We are grateful, Jesus. We are grateful. Thank you, God. something in your heart that says, man, I, I, I got to let go of something. That is the Holy Spirit. 
It's not an emotion. It's not the light color. It's not if there's smoke in the room. It's, it's simply the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and saying, I want you to give you everything. I want you to give you my everything. Come on. We're going to sing that I surrender. And I want you to, in this moment, just raise your hands with me if you would. Everybody, come on. We're just going to give it to them. Just physically do something that says we're giving it to you. So whatever it is, maybe you got a diagnosis this week. Maybe you heard a word that was a negative and you heard and it's been going over in your head. Maybe there's a person that every time you walk out your front door, or maybe it's before you walk out your front door, and it just feels like it's pulling you down, pulling you into a different place. No, Jesus, he speaks through your circumstances, right in the middle of them. So we're going to surrender that thing. So raise that thing, that person that's holding you back from just focusing on the Lord right now. There's going to be freedom in this place today. Come on. Say, God, surrender. Oh, I surrender all. Oh, give it to him. He's the great physician. Oh, his burden is easy. It's light. Giving it to him, now we celebrate it. I surrender. Yeah, I All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do Every song must end, and you never do. And so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a heart.
and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah. We're gonna sing it again, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I throw up my hands for the king. Come on. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a grateful for him this morning amen hey tell somebody next to you that you're grateful this morning before we watch the video welcome to northwest church if you are new to northwest please make sure to fill out the connection card included in your bolts and then bring it to the info table outside the lobby after service our team members will be ready to meet you and to hand you a small gift to say thank you for joining us today if you'd like to be a part of God's work at Northwest through your finances, we have four ways you can give in person and online. You can give on campus at a giving box, digital kiosk in the lobby, at nwc.org, or simply text the word give to the number on the screen. If you're looking for a place to take your little ones or if they become a distraction during the message, we have a family room ready for you. Just ask an usher or a volunteer and they'd be happy to walk you there. Now, here are a few events that you need to know about. Parents, it's time to mark your calendars for five days of fun. Dates are June 24th to the 28th, and the fun begins each day at 9 a.m. I promise your kids' minds will be blown away by how much fun they have and that they will grow so much closer to Jesus. If you have a heart for missions, our Congo Orphanage Shoes and Clinic Diaper Donations Drive is underway on April 14th and 21st. Please bring your donations to drop off at our designated locations that day. To learn about other events like our Southern Gospel Concert, check out your bulletin for more information. Thanks for watching. Now, with the second message in our Gratitude Sermon Series, here's our lead pastor, Will Stahl. Good morning. Great to see you all. I'm Will, lead pastor here at Northwest Church. And just as I'm walking up on the stage, you know, I'm always talking to the Lord. And I just said, I am grateful to be here today. I am grateful that I get to be your pastor. I'm grateful for all of you. The night I'm most grateful for you guys is actually Friday night, Kami night. We have this amazing time. Didn't we have a great time? It's like the best night of the year. You guys gotta come next year. We had so much fun, we laughed. Uh, so much was given for the students and uh, we just have an amazing youth team. It's led by Pastor David Lopez. He is doing a great job. You saw Jessica, his wife on stage and she's doing a great job We're on the video. And uh, I'm just grateful for our team here. We have an amazing staff and grateful to be part of it. Well, last week we began this new series we're calling Gratitude. And we said that gratitude has the ability to transform your life in every way. It will change your physical health. It will change your mental health, your relationships, your spirituality. When you are grateful, 
everything is changed in you. And today, I want to share with you a principle of gratitude that I've actually practiced for about 30 years. It's ingrained into me. Once you begin to practice this, you will never turn back. Imagine for a moment that I was diagnosed with stage four cancer and I'm looking for a cure and somehow in all of my luck, I stumble on to a cure for cancer and it works. Like I'm just totally cured. I was terminal, now I'm cured. And I just say, you know, this is great for me, but you know, I'm just gonna keep it to myself. And then I have some relatives and they're diagnosed, same cancer, stage four. And I say, you know what? I'm just not gonna tell them. What kind of a person would I be if I do that? Not a good person, right? I'm, I'm hoarding this amazing cure. What I'm gonna share with you today is equally incredible. It isn't a medical breakthrough, but it's a truth from God so profound that to withhold it from you would be a disservice. I wanna share with you a way to express your gratitude to God, and I believe of all the forms, it's the pinnacle of them. But before I tell you about that, let me introduce this in another way. Imagine for a moment that you are a physician, a doctor in 1800, and you believe in all the latest medical techniques and practices, and you do all of them, sometimes to the disservice of your patients. Even though George Washington, just a few years earlier, met his demise because of bloodletting, you believe in it. You know, you think if you let enough blood out, all the bad stuff will get out of somebody and maybe that they'll just recover. You do surgeries and half of the time, your patients die because you're oblivious to something that people are calling germs. So you go from dissecting a corpse to delivering a baby. And you know, the mom dies sometimes, but that happens in childbirth, right? You know, especially for you. And then you've got some colleagues and they're into this new hysteria called hand washing. And they've lost their credibility and sometimes their careers because the other doctors are like, yeah, that's crazy, what are you talking about? Even though in 1199 AD, a man named Moses Maimon had started to do hand washing before all his operations and had great results, published those results, a Hungarian named Ignaz Simmelweis in 1841 would come along and do these really technical experiments and it would show that hand washing actually works when you do surgery. But he was very hesitant to put his results out there and publish them. In fact, his students did it because he would be mocked for doing it. And now imagine, I ask you, doctor in the 1800s to consider washing your hands before you do a surgery, scrubbing up, good. Would you do it? And now imagine it isn't me. Imagine for a moment, God himself writes you a letter. You get a text message, an email from God. And he says, for the love of God, wash your hands before you do a surgery. Would you heed what God says? Today, what I wanna share with you is equally transformational. It will change the trajectory of your life. And it's as controversial as hand washing was in 1800s to the physicians. What I wanna to talk to you about today is giving back to God financially as a way of saying thank you for the blood of Jesus that causes me to have a relationship with you and an eternity in heaven. What I wanna share with you has been overlooked by the church, not embraced. We tolerate it, we don't celebrate it. But it warrants celebrating just as we do worship when we're singing to God, lifting up our hands and expressing our love to Him. Because giving back to God is not merely an obligation. It is the greatest way to express our gratitude, our faith, our trust, and our devotion to our Creator. And yet, this topic in church is about as welcome as a cockroach on a wedding cake. And pastors hate to talk about it. 
although there are 38 parables of Jesus where he deals with possessions and money and how we handle those things. Although in the four gospels, one in every 10 verses is about giving in our possessions, 288 verses. There are just over 500 verses in the Bible that deal with prayer, less than 500 that deal with faith, and yet there are 2,000 verses in the Bible that deal with your money and your possessions. And I think that a pastor who doesn't talk about this is not worth his salt. And I don't think he loves his people because you are the ones that will benefit from this. It's better than a life-saving cure. It's the very first lesson in the entire Bible. After we're told how God creates the heavens and the earth, he makes man, it's the first lesson we learn. Genesis chapter four and verse three, the Bible says, Cain and Abel were born, and in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering. And what kind of an offering? It just says, of the fruit of the ground. It's described as a something. And Abel brought the first born of his flock. See the adjective there? The first, the best. And their fat portions, the best he had. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Do you see how close Abel is to his offering in the sight of God? They're right together. God says, I accept you and your offering. Okay. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. They're right together too. Cain offering. And so Cain was angry, as people get sometimes when you talk about money, okay? And his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? He says, this isn't the end. If you do well, you will be accepted. He says, the door is open. This isn't one and done. Like you didn't mess up for life. No, just be like your brother and do a little bit better. Now, Cain kind of said this, God, look, I gave you something. You're going to take it or you're going to leave it. And God says, okay, I'll leave it. And he got mad and he killed his brother. And there was a curse on Cain the rest of his life. Today, I want to show you a life-saving principle, a life-changing principle that if you begin to practice, you will never, ever, ever go back. Out of Malachi chapter three and verse six. We'll read this and then we'll talk about it. He starts out and God says, I, the Lord, do not change. You know why I think God said that there? I don't know. I think that maybe God knows what's gonna happen in the future. And I think that God looked down through time and saw people in 2024 and they'd be saying, oh yeah, but that was in the Old Testament and God was way different back then. And so he says, I think I'm gonna start out like this. I, the Lord, do not change. My principles are what they are. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days your father, you have turned aside my statutes and have not kept them. He says, look, return to me. I want you back. Just like Cain, he says, look, look, look you can do better, come on, come back and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how will we return to you? He says, oh, you want me to tell you? Okay. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. You say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed. Oh, there it is again, just like Cain. Cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me the whole nation of you. First thing I want you to notice is the curse. He says, you are under a curse, these people in Old Testament Israel. And you know what? I think today that still exists, that there's a curse that we're under financially when we don't do what God asks us to do. Now, in your car, you've got indicator lights. I had an indicator light going off in my car for about a month to when my tires were low. And I was like, yeah, I'm good. They look fine. And then after a while, about a month goes by, and the car just says, look, this is ridiculous. Pull over and stop right now because you're gonna have rims left. I didn't even know the car could talk to me like that, but it, it does. The indicator light. So if I put a sticky note over the light, guess what? Goes away, it covers it up. 
If I ignore it, it covers it up. But you know what? The problem doesn't go away because the light's not the problem. The problem is no air in one of the tires. In the same way, God says, there's a warning light going off here. You're not in fellowship with me. And what is at stake is that your blessings get devoured. And they go far beyond financial blessings. There are other things that God wants to bless your life with, probably things you're praying for and asking God for. He puts it this way in the next verse, Malachi 3.11. He says, I will rebuke the devourer so that you will not destroy the fruit. It will not destroy your fruit of your soil and the vine in the fields. He says, there's a devourer, there's pests. They're eating up the fruit in your field. They're eating up your vines. Now, we don't think of things like that. We think, oh, well, something bad happened. You don't think of it as you're under this curse and there's a devourer taking the things that God wants to give you. We think, oh, I just lost my job. I just have this medical bill. I just got this legal issue over here. Or I just had identity theft, I guess, or this high interest debt that I'm dealing with, or my business, I guess it just decreased for no reason. I guess I just had a car problem, car accident, tax issue. Must be the economy, the recession. But maybe heaven is closed to you. Maybe you're under a curse. And the curse causes dissatisfaction. Even if you have everything you need, you're not satisfied with it. You walk into your closet, it's full of clothes. You say what? I have nothing to wear. You have, but you're not happy with it. You could be happy with a Ford Festiva or a Ferrari. You could be happy with a mobile home or a mansion, but you're not satisfied. And we put ourselves under the curse instead of under the blessing of God because we disobey God. And God is saying here, I do not want you under a curse. I want to bless you. But when you're under the curse of God, nobody can bail you out. A new job doesn't bail you out. A new politician, a new economy, nothing will bail you out. Because number two, here's the cause of it. Number two, he says this, here's the cause. Malachi 3, 9. You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me. You're robbing me of the tithes and the offerings. So how do you return? He says, stop robbing me. Michael Brown, 33 years old, was arrested in Marked Tree, Arkansas for robbing a bank. But he didn't take money. The cameras caught him taking a clock radio, a CD player, and a handful of dum-dums. According to the Arkansas Democrat uh, the Gazette, the police found a trail of dumb, dumb rappers all the way to his house. Now that's a dumb robbery. But this is dumber. And God is sort of in this passage reacting to the discovery. And he says, will a man actually rob his own creator? Will a man actually rob his own savior? Will a man rob his own redeemer? Will a man rob the one who put his name in the book of life? Will a man rob the one who made heaven his home? Will a man rob the one who shed his blood on the cross for him? Who could be so low? Who could be so ungrateful? And who could be so despicable? And God is shocked. He's in disbelief. Will a man go into the police station and just rob them in front of everyone? God sees everything. He judges everything. And he says, you're wearing the tithe. You're driving the tithe. You're watching the tithe. You're playing with the tithe. You're vacationing on the tithe. You're investing the tithe. You're paying bills on the tithe. And it doesn't belong to you. It's holy. It belongs to God. So for a robbery to occur, there must be ownership of something. And God says, I own the tithe. And the truth is God owns all of it. Everything you have belongs to God. You are a manager. You are a steward. And if you don't believe it, just die. You'll see. You own nothing. God owns it all. We think, I work hard for my money, and you do, and I deserve every cent of it. But God reminds you in Deuteronomy 8, 18, where it all comes from. 
you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. He gives you life, vitality, opportunity, all the people that make up the business that you are in. God provides all of that and he can take it away. Jesus put it this way in Luke chapter 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. There's two. You're either gonna hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. Here's the masters. You can't serve God and money. And when you begin to obey God in the area of finance, you say, God, you're first in my heart. You're first in my life. And you know, our finances and our spirituality have always gone hand in hand. It did with Cain and even with Jesus. And Jesus says in Matthew 19, verse 16, a rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, teacher, what good deed must I do to enter into eternal life? He says, you wanna do a good deed? Here we go. If you'd be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give it to the poor. You're gonna have treasure in heaven. You wanna be rich? You're, how about be rich forever? And then come and follow me. And the young man was sorrowful. He had great possessions. He says, no, I'm not doing that. Can you imagine? Jesus says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So here's the command, very simple. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. The storehouse. A tithe, one-tenth, 10%. The average American gives 2% of their money to charity. So if a person earned $1,000 in a week, 2% would be a $20 bill. Uh, a tithe would be $100 of that. Only 8% of Christians actually practice tithing. This is why 20% of the people actually support 80% of what a church is doing. But God doesn't say in this passage, now what I'm gonna tell you here is for old people. What I'm telling you here is for wealthy people. What I'm telling you here is for people who don't, who have a way more than they need. No, he says, this is for everyone. And I learned this as a child, started practicing it more as an adult, but I can remember as a teenager, I'd have a lawn mowing business. I'd make $20. I'd go to the church and I'd say, okay, Lord, the first $2 was yours. Now, someone might say, well, but that's in the Old Testament, okay? And now we're under grace. So we don't need to do any of that stuff. So under grace, we need to do less for God. Is that what we're saying? Here's the truth. This isn't an Old Testament thing. God begins by saying, I, the Lord, don't change. Remember that. But this predates the law. In Genesis 14, long before the law was given, Melchizedek, priest of God, he gave 10%, the very first, to God. And Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 23, repeats this. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's actually rebuking the Pharisees. He says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of the law, you Pharisees and hypocrites. You're careful to tithe even of the tiniest income of your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. And then he says, yeah, you should tithe. Yes, but don't neglect the more important things. We're not talking about equal giving. God doesn't expect people to give equally. He's talking about equal sacrifice. Jesus was watching people give at the temple. Isn't that interesting? He's at the temple and he's just watching. And a woman comes after these Pharisees come and they dump in lots of money. And she has two coins to live on. And she dink, dink, plunks them in. People must have snickered and laughed because Jesus says, what she did, she gave more than everybody else because she gave what she had to live on. Somebody says, well, I can't afford to tithe. I mean, according to this, you can't afford not to tithe. And you know what? God never asked you to give what you don't have. There was an old preacher who went to one of his parishioners, he's a farmer, and he gets on the farm and he says, hey, you know, if you had two $100 bills, would you give one of them to the Lord? Farmer says, oh, preacher, you know I would do that. He says, well, it, what if you had two cows? Would you give one of them to the Lord? Farmer says, preacher, you know me. I would, of course, give one of those cows to the Lord. The preacher says, well, if you had 
two pigs, would you give one of them to the Lord? Farmer says, now that's not fair. You know I have two pigs. God never asks you for what you don't have. The average Christian gives 2.7% of their income to a church. It's no wonder we're victims, not victors. It's no wonder we're borrowing, not lending. He says, bring it into the storehouse. That was the temple of the time. Today, the church represents that. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, speaking of the church, the Bible says that Jesus Christ himself is the cornerstone of the church in whom we have the whole structure being joined together and it grows into a holy temple in the Lord. This is his temple. He says, "Where bring it to the storehouse. Bring it to where you're being fed. Don't take it to a worthy cause. That's where the offering comes in over and above that tithe. Don't take the Lord's money elsewhere because he says, I wanna have food in my house. He says, I wanna be able to reach the world with the gospel. We do that through missions. We do that through reaching people in Fresno, through supporting all of the needs of you have. So here's the challenge, number four, and this is where it gets really good. Malachi chapter three, verse 10, he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby he says, here's challenge, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing until there is no more need. This is the only time in the word of God that God says, test me. Every other time he says, trust me, believe in me, just have faith in me. Don't put your Lord, your God to the test. But this time he says, test me. When it comes to our finances, this is as close as it gets to your heart. Some of you are saying, I think I prefer the cockroach or my wedding cake. You're talking about all this stuff. But watch this. God says, if you test me, I will always be as good as my word. Now, here's the question for you. Is God real or not? Is his word true or not? We practice what we really believe. If we believe something, we do it. The rest is just religious talk. So I'm talking about making that a lifestyle for you. And for 25 years as a lead pastor, I've been preaching the same message and I've given this challenge lots of times. And I wanna make it again. If you begin to test God in this, we'll partner with you. And for the next 90 days, you say, okay, God, I'm gonna put you in the test. I'm gonna begin to give that first 10th to you. If after 90 days, you say, you know what? This just did not work out for me. God did not come through. I have all these bills and needs. Every penny you can get back. All you don't have to tell me, just call our financial guy, Richard. And you know what? I have made that challenge and hundreds of people over the years have taken me up on that. Their lives have been transformed and changed. Not even one person's called, but you can be the first. And I'll tell you what, I, would, I won't even know about it. They won't even tell me your name. But I'll tell you what, believe and trust God. And, and for me, there's no greater proof that I know I believe in God. Here's why. Everything else in life, people kind of see that you do. This is private. Nobody even knows what you're doing there. Only you and God. And so when you test God that way, you're saying, okay, Lord, I believe. This is how much I believe in you. I'm gonna put you to the test. And number five, here's the consequence. He says, see if I will not open the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing until there is no more need in your life. Jesus repeats that in Luke chapter six, verse 38. He says, give and it's gonna be given to you. How much? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, be put in your lap. The measure you use will be measured back to you. You say, God, I have a thimble here. I'm gonna, just gonna give you a little bit. God says, I have a thimble. I'll give you back a little bit. You say, I have a shovel. God says, my shovel's bigger. You can't outgive God. In Haggai, God was warning the people. He says, there's some things going on in your life. There's a devourer going on in your life. Haggai chapter one, verse five. He says, now therefore, says the Lord, consider your ways. Think about how you're living. You have sown much and harvested little. These things are, you're doing, they're not working out. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, you never have your fill. 
You clothe yourselves, but you're not warm. He who earns wages, he does them, he puts them in a bag, and the bag has holes in it. Is it does that ring a bell to any of you? Like you're like, my money just goes into this bag, and there's holes in the bag. God says, consider your ways. Go to the hills, bring in wood, and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, it blew away. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts, because my house lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself building his own house. They heard this. They said, you know what? You're right. We didn't build the temple first. We didn't build that church first. Instead, we did our own stuff. And so you know what? They turned around and God blessed these people over and over and over. And God will do the same for you. There's a little boy that came into a store with his mom and it was a country store. There was some candy on the countertop. And the owner of the store said to the boy, do you want some candy? He said, yeah. And the owner said, well then, put your hand in there and grab a handful. The boy just stood there. He says, go on, get you some candy. The boy just stood there. So finally, the owner put his hand in the jar and gave it to the boy. He kind of went out of the store with all this candy. And his mom said to him, why were you so rude? Why didn't you just take the candy when he told you? And the little boy said, because his hand was bigger than mine. God's hand is bigger than yours, I promise you. God can do more for you than you can do for yourself. God can make a 90% go way further than 100%. And he does it for me, and he has been for 30 years. So how do you begin? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. Paul says like this. On the first day, what's the first day of the week? That's a Sunday. Each one of you put aside something, store it away, as he may prosper. So you prosper a little bit, then you give God a little bit. You prosper medium, you give God a medium. You prosper a lot, you give God a lot. It's a percentage. You say, well, how do I know what percentage to give? Well, I think you go back to Malachi chapter three. That's what my recommendation would be. You know, test God. It's like hand washing before surgery. Now you might just say, well, I only have enough faith to give God 3%. Okay, then give him the 3%. Test God on that. You tell me, I got 10 surgeries in a given day. I'm going to wash my hands three times. All right. Hope it's, hope I'm the one afterward, you know. And I guarantee you're going to have more success washing your hands three times than no times. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Here's the point, Paul says. You sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. But, he says, this is important. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. Never give because you think people are going to see you give. Never give because you feel com- compelled. God loves a cheerful giver, he says. And he is able to make, look at, look at these words here. All grace abound to you, having all sufficiency in all things at all times, that you may abound in every good work. God just says, look, whatever your needs are, you know who I am. Like, I spoke a word and the world came into existence. Give you an idea what I can do for you? You're like, no. Just put God to the test and you're gonna see. Man had a nightmare. And in his nightmare, he went to church. He gave God his, his offering. And God comes to him and he says, I'm going to take your offering and I'm going to multiply that times 10. And that will be your weekly income. And of course, he lost his TV. He lost his car. He lost his house. He says, after all, what can you do with $10? Right? Now imagine this nightmare. Imagine you get to heaven and God says to you, hey, I want to show you something here. I have this room. And in this room, there were these blessings that you'd prayed for you desired, you wanted, never happened in your life. And God says, these are blessings that I had planned for you. And all you had to do was just trust me a little bit. To me, that's the nightmare, that I miss out 
on what God has for me because of a little bit of faith. But faith is like this. You know how you get more muscle? You get more muscle by using the muscle you got. You don't say, man, if I can't best bench press 250 pounds, well, then I'm not going to do it at all. No, you start where you're at, 50 pounds, then to 60, then to 100, and then it keeps going. And all of a sudden, you get more muscle. Faith is the same way. Begin by saying, God, I'm going to trust you. Trust you a little bit more. You will never regret it. It's the pinnacle of giving. I understand what I'm telling you is controversial, and a lot of people don't talk about it because they don't want to offend anybody. But I'll tell you what. If I had the cure for cancer, I'd give it to you. If you were a doctor, not washing your hands, I'd be like, oh man, just, you gotta try this. Give this a chance, right? For the love of your patients, for the love of God, give this a chance. That's how I feel about this because I have seen what God has done in my life and the lives of people I know intimately. And they will tell you, "Mm, I'd never go back. Maybe today you're coming in here and you're saying, you know what? I'm not 100% certain that I have eternal life if I was to die. You know what God wants from you? He wants your heart. He wants to give you a free gift, eternal life. If you've never received that gift, the Bible says Jesus is there knocking at the door of your heart. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into them and dine with them and they with me. He wants to have a meal with you. He provides everything. You just come as you are. The Bible said, God loves you as you are. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were an enemy of God, shaking our fist in God's face. And he says, I'm still going to die for you. That's the love he has for you as you sit here today. If you've never received Jesus and had this incredible change in your life, why don't you make today the day You put the stake in the ground. You say, once and for all, I'm gonna believe in Jesus and trust in him. I'd like to ask you to bow your head right now, close your eyes. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray a simple prayer. If this prayer expresses your desire to know Jesus as savior, I'm gonna ask you to pray it along with me in your heart to God. Quietly before God, you might pray something like this. Lord Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. Right now, to the best of my ability, I ask you to become my Lord and my Savior. Once and for all, I believe in you, and I trust you to give me eternal life. Thank you for making me your child. Thank you for giving me eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that decision today, that's the greatest decision you'll ever make. The angels rejoice in heaven. The saints in heaven are rejoicing. And we want to rejoice with you. You got to see four people get baptized today. Some of you want to get baptized next week because you're going to let the the world know you're under new management. So whether it's next week or the week after, write in your comment card that you've been saved. You put your faith in Jesus and we'll show you how you can uh, get baptized. I want to pray one more time. Is there anybody in here who's thinking, you know what, I would like the windows of heaven to open up for me. Anyone here looking like that? I am, I'm thinking that too. So you know what, if God has more for you, then let's ask God for it. And let's just say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do. Can you pray that with me today? Whatever your will is for me to do, that's what I wanna do. Let's, Let's pray together. Father. We just read about a man who went away sorrowful because he says, I'm not gonna do that. I pray that nobody would go away sorrowful today. I pray that whatever you put on our hearts, we would be willing to say, Lord, you are my master. No one else, nothing else. And we put you first. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand so we can worship one more time?
oh come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a line inside of those lungs get up and praise the lord so come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got info desk as you exit info counter outside i don't know if it's still raining maybe the sun's breaking through but hey take a second there's a free gift for you we want to meet you but would you do this right now would you just lift your hands i'm going to just give you a benediction as you leave may the god who watches over you with his angels be so present so known to your mind and heart this week look for him he's there he's guiding you so jesus i pray that you protect everyone in this room lord and we know that if if you are for us, nothing can stand against us. So I ask for divine protection over this place, divine growth in every family, every individual in this place until we meet again. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. We'll see you next Sunday.